We're going to call to order the December 7th, 2018 Anderson Township Zoning Commission. would like to have an approval of the agenda. Need a motion? So I'll moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. McBride? Yes. Mr. Gothard? Yes. Mr. Ellis? Yes. Mr. Reagan? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. So the second item then is the approval of the minutes from October 22nd, 2018. I believe we have enough commissioners. Need a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve as submitted. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. McBride? Abstain. Mr. Gothard? Yes. Mr. Ellis? Yes. Mr. Reagan? Abstain. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Okay. We're up to item three. A discussion of the zone change request in case 3-2018 of Anderson, property located at 6201 and 6301 Clough Pike. Go to a staff report. Thank you. Before we begin, there were copies of the staff report on the table. I think we're probably out now, hard copies. It's also on our website if you wanted to pull up our website and follow the staff report online, or hopefully you can share your hard copies. Um, but the presentation I'll be given is geared off of the staff report. So the, lo the applicant is Cincinnati AL Investors LLC on behalf of Kinder 8 LLC and SWGR Clough LLC. Uh, who are property owners. The location is at 6201 and 6301 Clough Pike, and the current zoning is A residence. The request is a zone change from A residence to DD planned multifamily for the purpose of constructing an approximately 119,000 square foot senior living facility that would consist of both memory, memory care and assisted living. Uh, the proposal is for two buildings. Um, a, a, two stories each. Building A would have a height of 30 feet and building B would have a height of 32 feet. And the buildings would be connected by a walkway. Um, a total of 123 assisted living beds, or 123 beds total uh, with 84 parking spaces. As far as the site itself, it's approximately nine acres, 8.95 acres. The frontage is 717 feet on Clough Pike. The topography is sloping towards the rear of the property and it's also uh, in the floodplain of Clough Creek. The existing use, one of the parcels has a single family residence which is vacant uh, and some accessory buildings, a detached garage and an, and an outbuilding and then the other parcel uh, was formerly farmed, it was agriculture until recently uh, which has been just allowed to grow up. The home itself was built in 1939. History on this particular case, the township hosted a pre-submittal meeting in July of 2018. Um, at that particular meeting, this was our open house, and we heard from surrounding property owners and concerned residents. The concerns brought up at that meeting were the intensity of the development, disruption of Clough Creek, and then just overall disruption of the character of Clough, of Clough, of Clough Pike uh, with the intensity that was proposed at that time. The applicant proceeded and made application to regional planning on September the 4th and the regional planning staff um, conducted their review and recommended denial of the application. Based off of that recommendation, the applicant withdrew their application, met with staff, met with regional planning staff and made revisions um, of the plan more consistent to address the concerns at the open house. So most recently on December the 6th, the regional planning commission conducted a public hearing and they heard the case on the revised plans um, and still recommended denial. The denial was based off of consistency of the township's future land use plan and the comprehensive plan. Um, based off of the consistency, the regional planning recommended denial and did not discuss the case further. They only discussed consistency with the comprehensive plan. This is the property location again on Clough Pike. Um, Let's see here. So this is the vacant piece that was formerly used for agriculture. This is the single family home and the two outbuildings. This is Clough Creek uh, following the southern portion of the property, Clough Pike. 
This is the Moats farm operation. Other uses in the vicinity are single family. This is township open space. And then to the east of the site is the Woods of Turpin apartment um, community. This is an aerial of the site. Again, the, the portion that was farmed, um, the Moats farming operation, Woods of Turpin apartments. Topography of the site, as stated earlier, it slopes toward the creek. And um, there are other plans in your packet that show the floodplain of the creek as well as the floodway of the creek. Surrounding topography to the south is very steep, and then also on both sides you can tell it's very steep, um, so there's varying topography in the Clough Valley. This was the revised site plan that was submitted that was different than what was submitted um, during the summer. But again, Building A and Building B, this would be the memory care building, and then the as, um, assisted living building. Parking is primarily in the rear of the structure, and I won't go into the details too much. I'll let the applicant go into the details of the components of their site plan. Um, I, I want to focus our conversation on the um, consistency with the comprehensive plan. They are proposing two access points on Clough Pike, one on either end of the property. There is an existing uh, creek or swale that runs through the property, and that would remain. Um, and that's what you see here. Again, parking in the front for guests um, and then parking in the rear for employees. These were the changes that were made from the original submittal to the current submittal. Again, I'll let the applicant go over these changes in more detail. These are the elevation drawings that have been submitted, a mixture of building materials. Again, two stories in height. Um, this is the courtyard area where the main entrance would be located. This would be the view from Clough Pike. Another view from Clough Pike looking more directly at the property. And this drawing was to um, identify the distance to set back from the center line of Clough Pike. The distance is noted as 170 feet. There is a right of way, a half right of way of 50 feet from the center line of Clough Pike. So the actual setback would be approximately 120 feet, um, but this was to give an idea of the, the cross section from Clough Pike. Site photos, this is looking toward the creek, generally looking, uh, if you're heading west toward 32, this is looking in that direction of the, what was formerly farmed. This is the existing house on the, sh on the one property. Again, looking from Clough Pike on the south side of Clough Pike. Again, looking toward 32 in that direction. This is a portion of the site is the site in question. The remaining piece is township open space. These are pictures of the creek. This is Clough Pike in the background. Um, again, <coughs> the site in question. Um, this. I believe this is looking toward Clough Pike with a house uh, across the street on the north side of Clough Pike. This is looking at the Moats farming operation. So we'll go through staff findings. In reviewing a zone change, the township's review consists of compliance with the Anderson Township Comprehensive Plan, the Anderson Trails Plan, and then the township design guidelines as well as consistency with the township zoning resolution. So first we'll discuss the comprehensive plan starting with the future land use map. Um, the future land use map identifies this particular piece as single family residence, um, consistent with the underlying zoning, which is zoned A. Um, and that was the basis of denial from regional planning's decision, was that it was inconsistent with the color on the map, essentially. Um, staff is of the opinion that that's true it's not it's the color on the map the zoning district that we use for these types of facilities are DD plan multifamily they're also permitted in a retail area but uh, the majority of these facilities are located in a DD zoning district and um, previous developments that have come before you one was located in a institutional area that was identified on our future land use map so on our future land use map, the areas identified for institutional were based off of the current use of the property. So these were properties that were churches, 
that were schools or were owned by some nonprofit entity that were already institutional. We did not identify any new properties for institutional type uses because it's difficult to predict where these uses go. They're often conditional uses in uh, residential zoning. So they're heard before our Board of Zoning Appeals and are, are permitted under certain conditions. Um, this particular piece was identified to the current property owners as a potential redevelopment for something other than single family based on the surrounding conditions. We looked at the character of the site, the adjacent use of apartment community, the farming operation across the street, which is somewhat evolved in more of not your traditional farming operation, but more intense, similar to a retail or slash industrial use. So the difference of our review versus the, the county's review is that we looked, delved deeper into the text of the comprehensive plan, and therefore we felt that it, it could be considered um, a use for that site. These were some of the other chapters of, this, of the comprehensive plan that we looked at, people and housing, quality of life, and we felt that these, this development was consistent with the goals of those sections. And again, we've already um, discussed a little bit about the land use and development. In addition, a market analysis was done in 2016. This was a use that was identified as um, a need in the township. And therefore, our economic development team took the market analysis of our comprehensive plan and tried to locate areas within the township that could support those particular uses. And this was something that was recommended for this particular piece. The zoning resolution compliance, there was just not enough detail in the site plan to determine full compliance with the parking regulations. That's the landscaping, lighting, um, setback requirements. So if this were to move forward, those items would need to be addressed. Design guidelines. Staff believes that the placement of the property or the building it has been pushed further from the roadway, helping to create some type of buffer from the roadway and the and the facility. It's, it's concentrated on the interior piece of this property, so additional buffering could be done. And then the creek to the south of the property provides a natural buffer um, to properties from the south. Building materials, they are proposing a mixture of building materials. Uh, on, the, on the facility. So based off of this, um, staff's recommendation is approval. And there is a mistake on the PowerPoint as well as in the, st in the staff report. This should be from A residence to DD. It is currently zoned A. Um, staff feels that it is consistent with chapters four and six in the appendix of the comprehensive plan um, regarding the market study. It's compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. The health and safety of the neighborhood are maintained, and the proposed use of the site provides the applicant to realize a reasonable profit, not necessarily a maximum profit. Some of the conditions that are recommended by staff, again, submitting plans to show compliance with the zoning resolution. These are primarily from the parking article, um, landscaping, lighting. Um, staff strongly suggest a more substantial buffer on the western portion of the site. The eastern portion of the site has a creek as a natural buffer. Um, and then just the basic uh, sidewalk is proposed along the frontage of the property, but just that connection to the front door, which is just a zoning requirement. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll put this back on the site plan. Thanks, Paul. We'll start down with uh, Commissioner Reagan. No questions. Uh, yeah, just a couple for Paul. Um, the as it's zoned A now, what's what's a lot size requirement in the A? Twenty thousand square feet. So about a half acre. About a half acre. Okay. And um, have has your office received any interest in residential zoning for this property? Not this particular property. Okay. And my last question is um, to build in the floodplain area. Does it have to be built up, and how much, if you know? Um, they are showing that it is built up um, and needs to be located outside the 100 foot or 100 year floodplain. Um, and I'll let the engineer, the engineer is here. He can speak to the elevations that they are proposing to construct. Thanks. The engineer for the applicant? Yes. Can we? Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Gothard? Um, another staff question. Thank you. I have no 
I had one. Um, having, I, I sit here for a couple years, and I know we've had a few cases come through for assisted living and memory care. At, at any point, do we look at where we are in the market? Have we do we have enough? Are we saturated? Or I mean, I'm reminded every morning of the the aging. So where our, we, our our market study in 2016 identified that we did not we are not at capacity yet that there was a demand in the township specifically for new facilities as well but with the addition of the one that included the forest hills care center what about the one on it did not but including that we are still there is a demand okay. for new facilities in this area in the township all right anyone else we'll come back to staff okay at this point we'll ask the applicant to come forward state your name and affiliation Good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members. My name is Mike Roberts. I'm a lawyer with Graydon Head and Ritchie, and this is Monica Conan, my partner, who's with me today. Also today is Bob Goyette, who's the Chief Operations Officer for Harmony. Uh, Wynn Bishop, Senior Vice President of Development and Construction. Uh, Harmony and <coughs> Smith Packard out of Roanoke, Virginia. Also with us is Troy DeHaven, Real Estate Development Manager. And finally, Julian Beglin, who's the engineer that was referenced earlier, Julian is with a Jonestown PA outfit called HF Lens. Uh, thank you for hearing us today. I think uh, one of the first things I want to say is we've been attempting for a year now, since December 2007, to create the opportunity to partner with Anderson Township. As Mr. Dury just indicated, there's a significant need for uh, senior living homes in this community and every morning I look in the mirror I'm reminded about the need for senior living as well um, but for a year what we've attempted to do at Smith Packet and Harmony is to be a great partner we met with uh, the township beginning in December 2017 as I indicated June 5th we had a meeting with township staff July 25 a pre-development meeting with the county a neighborhood meeting, September 5, application to rezone, which we amended. And the project has come down, scaled down significantly, and has addressed every concern that we've heard along the way. And I think the presentation you're going to hear tonight will show that. Um, I did want to make one comment before I yield to, uh, I think maybe Wynn is next. Um, in front of the county, we were in a, a, an anomalous situation that I think was even difficult for the county. And I had the, the hearing transcribed, and I'm happy to elaborate it and, and share some remarks of the council members, but they were faced with a situation where their rules tied their hands. And so both procedurally and substantively, we really didn't have a chance to make our application. We were all in attendance, we were ready to go, but the committee just would not hear us based on technical rules that governed what they could and could not do. And I think Paul kind of said it well as to what that was. So in any event, we're happy to be able to give a substantive presentation tonight. And uh, Mr. Bishop. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Wynn Bishop, Senior Vice President of Development and Construction for Smith Packet. I appreciate you giving us the time tonight. We've worked really hard to gain the support of the township staff as well as economic development. Um, we've done that. We hope, obviously, to gain your support tonight. Um, I have a few brief comments about who Smith Packet is, what we do, why we're interested in this market. Uh, then I'd like to turn it over to Bob Guyette, who's the COO of Harmony, to talk a little bit. And then um, both Julian and Troy will go over some of the changes that were referenced earlier from our original plans. Um, so who is Smith Packet? Smith Packet is a senior housing development company. We're located in Roanoke, Virginia, with a second office in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Mr. Jim Smith started the company about 35 years ago. Um, it's still a family-owned business today. Um, for the last five or six years, uh, so we've been told we are one of the largest, if not the largest, senior housing developers in the nation. We currently have 22 open facilities. Um, about a dozen under construction and um, I think about 16 in development. 
Um, Harmony Senior Services is our uh, sister company and operating arm. So once we develop the site, build the building, we turn it over to Harmony to take care of the seniors from that point forward, and they do a very good job of doing that. Um, the question was asked about the need in the community, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Um, not only from the comprehensive plan that um, you guys did in 2016, but um, we have our own um, research team that has developed a matrix for, for all the markets that we look to go in. It's a very sophisticated matrix. It takes into consideration population, age, household income. I think it's 13 different things that they use. Um, one of them is competition, and they weigh competition existing and future in this market, and there's still a strong need in Anderson Township. Our model is very conservative. We, we, we've, we're busy. We don't need to stretch into markets that don't need our product. So we're very, um, we have people call us often wanting us to come to their community, but uh, we're very disciplined on this matrix in order to keep our success. We, we're not going to vary from that and stretch and go into a market that doesn't show the need. Um, the, I want to just give you a little big picture um, indication of what we do as far as our lifestyle. So most of our buildings, um, and Paul alluded to how we've shrunk down the size of this project, but most of our buildings are around 200,000 feet. Typically, we'll have independent living, assisted living, and memory care all under one roof. And again, we'll talk about how we pared this building down. But even though um, we're doing a smaller model, we still have a goal of getting all of our seniors out in the community to participate in the community. We have a van shuttle to get them out. I will elaborate on that some. We have a lot of activity in our building to get, we're trying to get the seniors out of their room into public spaces as much as we can. To that end, we have about a third of our building is common area. We have a large commercial kitchen. We have two large dining rooms, uh, fitness center, physical therapy center, pub or bistro, hospitality rooms, activity centers, beauty barber shop, outdoor space, a, a lot of amenities to try to get our seniors active, um, and, and, they, and they want to continue to live that active lifestyle. Um, so with that, I'll give you a brief overview of our, of our project. Um, and not to be redundant, but we did start about a year ago with Anderson. Um, our first meeting with them, we talked about a, our typical four-story, 200,000-foot building. They said, well, you're not going to probably get four-story or, or that big. So we did a building that was 180,000 square feet. And through all these different meetings and the community input and input from staff and uh, other folks, we pared our building down to about 120,000 feet, um, which eliminated about a third of our square footage. Um, we did that primarily by eliminating our independent living component of the building. Um, and by eliminating independent living, it also eliminated a lot of the traffic. They're the, they're the primary traffic generator for our building comes through independent living. Um, as you'll see from Troy and Julian, we decreased the mass of the building quite a bit. We went from a uh, four-story to a three-story, and then now it's a two-story building. Um, and we set the building back off the road. Um, quite a, we made two or three different changes to do that. Um, there's a lot of landscaping around our building. Um, we certainly understand the staff's comment on adding additional landscaping on the west side, which we're willing to do. We also have the, the town park on that side, so I feel like our building's very well screened um, in the community. Um, our, we, we will have about 123 units. Uh, by contrast, the apartment building next to us has a, have about 163 units. Um, we feel like we've sufficiently addressed traffic concerns and stormwater concerns. It was originally in the county report as a concern that was not in their last report, and I think we've addressed all those concerns. I think you'll also like the architectural um, slides that you see um, from Troy in a minute. Um, so, you know, we really feel that with the changes we've made that we are real strong, compatible use in the community. We feel like we'd be an asset to the community. We feel like once we're open and operating, the community will embrace us and, and like our use. And um, I'll turn it over to Bob um, Goyette to comment some from Harmony. Thank you, Chairman and uh, members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Bob Goyette. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Harmony Senior Services. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is how excited I am that in my company we're actually going to be building a community in my hometown. Uh, born and raised in Cincinnati, born in Good Sam, um, and just lived here most of my life. 
and so it's just nice to be back here. So um, that's exciting for me because we operate a lot of communities around the Midwest and operate a lot of communities in the Southeast, and to be back here in Cincinnati is really great. So um, I'll actually be up here next week for Christmas with my family. But what I wanted to say was what we do at Harmony Senior Services, we provide basically three things for our, um, for our residents and our families and our associates. We provide a quality of life for our, for our residents, for our seniors, and we provide peace of mind for our families, and we provide a quality work environment for our associates. And that's all so important to us, and that's really what we do. That's, that's the sort of crux of what we do. But I also wanted to say that, that a, a senior living community is great for the neighborhood. And I can tell you this because we've built communities in many neighborhoods, and I've built communities in many neighborhoods. We partner with local businesses. Um, we partner with local restaurants. We bring local restaurants in to cook. We take our residents out to local restaurants. Um, we partner with local colleges. We have, res we have um, some professors that will come in and actually teach classes to our residents. Uh, and so we do like to partner with local churches as well. So we take our residents out to churches, we bring churches into our, into our community. And we provide a wide variety of events, not only for our residents, but for the local community as well. For instance, at Christmas time, we'll have a nice Christmas open house. We'll invite all of our neighbors. We have charity partner events. We raise um, money for the Alzheimer's Association, for breast awareness, our breast cancer awareness. And we, we do a lot of different things to try to actually be a good corporate citizen, reach out to the community. And what can we do for Anderson Township? Because it's important to us. We can't be successful just by building a building and just saying, okay, we're open, just everyone come to us that need care. We're successful because we partner with the local communities um, in giving back. And also, to be a good resource, we provide services to residents with assisted living needs and memory loss. And unfortunately, the incidence of Alzheimer's and other related dementias are getting higher and higher. And we will have a specialized memory care neighborhood. But more important than that, we will be experts on that. And people can call us when they have questions. We will run support groups, not only for our community, but for the entire community. We'll run Alzheimer's certified support groups. And so what we do is we touch many, many lives. We love what we do. I've been in this business 30 years. Like I said, I'm just so excited to be here in Cincinnati and really looking forward to not only providing great assisted living and memory care services, but just being a great neighbor and being a great partner. So thank you. Good evening. I'm Troy DeHaven, real estate development manager for Smith Packet. Thank you again for having us this evening. Um, wanted to touch a little bit about our uh, development and um, some things that maybe we didn't touch on earlier. We've actually fine-tuned the floor plans here and we're at 122 units. Um, so sorry about the, the 123 up there, but we have fine-tuned it to 122. Um, two key things about our developments is we don't have, our residents don't have school-age children, so there's no burden on the school system. Second thing is when mentioned, most of our residents don't drive and we've um, taken out the independent living component, which was the majority of the residents who do drive. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another good thing about our project is that it will create, create between 75 and 100 jobs for uh, people in the community. Our um, development will create both uh, real estate uh, taxes, benefits, and business taxes for the uh, for the community. It's a great transitional use between um, the apartments and the agricultural and single-family resident uh, residential area. It's a good um, two things that we didn't really talk about were it's a good opportunity for local residents to age in place. They can stay in the community. And <clears throat> another thing about the developments that we do, it's not a continuum of care. So there's not this huge buy-in that a lot of um, competitors ask for. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Paul's talked about the site. It's an um, assemblage of two different properties. There's the six-acre parcel that's uh, mostly been used as farmland, and then the three-acre, approximately three-acre parcel that has a vacant house on it. 
see. Um, Paul has already mentioned we're asking or, um, or seeking a planned multiple resident district DD. <coughs> some, uh, some things about the site plan. So, excuse me, along Clough Pike, we have a sidewalk for connectivity to the adjacent um, right down here to the um, create connectivity to the adjacent uh, properties. Behind that is an actual six foot tall berm to help screen the building from Claw Pike. We were going to uh, plant trees on that berm, but we were told that we couldn't. So um, what we're doing is doing trees behind it to add additional screening. We pushed the building back 40 feet further than what's required for the front yard setback. We've also pushed most of the parking to the rear of the building um, to screen that the parking from the road. <coughs> Excuse me. The ponds, the stormwater ponds in the back, they are sized at not only 100% of stormwater runoff for our site, but they're sized at 120% to capture an additional 20% in the event of a, of a major rainfall. Um, our architect, my architect, actually engaged a local architect, and they went out and did a survey of some of the local uh, buildings, residences, and one thing they noticed was that there's a lot of stone and wood being used, and <clears throat> so I think you'll see in these perspectives or renderings that we're trying to incorporate some of those elements in our design. You'll see... Um, stone there at the first floor, second floor, uh, with wood elements, particularly at the entrance, um, and also up in the, uh, up by the rooftops. Let's see. This, this gives you um, kind of a perspective of what you'll see from Cloth Pike. You'll see the six-foot berm, the trees behind it, helping screen from uh, Claw Pike, and I believe that's 170 feet from the center line to the, uh, to the edge of the building. And again, it's 40 foot, we've pushed it back 40 feet further than what's actually required. Um, you know, we've listened to the residents' concerns, county's concerns, township concerns, and here are some of the things we've done. We've gone from three-story, when we typically do four-story, down to two-story here. We've eliminated the independent living component altogether, <coughs> which helps reduce the square footage. We went from 180 down to 120,000 square feet. Um, we've, uh, we did have parking out front. We've moved that to the rear of the building. Um, I'll let Julian get into some of the additional uh, information about the impervious areas, but happy to answer any questions that you have. We'll uh, hold our questions until everyone's completed with the presentation, and we'll come okay. back around, and then you can decide who should answer the question from your team. Okay. And well, I'll let Julian introduce himself. He's our civil engineer on the project. Hi, my name is Julian Beglin. I'm with HF Lens Engineering. Been with uh, HF Lens about 15 years, and I've been engineering for about 20 years. Um, we do a lot of construction um, all over the country, and uh, this is no exception. We do um, land development, and I just want to say that the township um, has a very good roadmap for us to design to. Um, so when we come into do any kind of development such as this, the first thing we do is we look at your ordinance and we try and decide how to best make those uh, items fit. So with this, respect to this plan, um, before I elaborate on what Troy has, has uh, started there, um, what we try and do is we try and get the, the buildings and the landscaping, the parking and the stormwater to fit on the property. So we managed to get the original plan to fit, and then we've reduced it from there. And every time we've made those changes, we've tried to incorporate more and more of the 
um, requests of the, both the residents and of the commission. Um, so if I can elaborate um, from where we were before, obviously you can see there's a list of items up there. I'm just going to go through those remaining items. Um, we have started out with 134 parking spaces. Like Troy said, we had a lot of them in the front. We actually had a driveway that went all the way across the front of the property. Uh, we've reduced that and made that access just to the front of the uh, assisted living component. So there's a loop in there. Uh, it's all two-way uh, to make sure we have a safe and secure access. So now we're down to 84 spaces, and those are primarily on the uh, side and the rear of the property. Um, we've also uh, reduced, there really isn't any parking in front of the uh, memory care because none of those residents will be driving. So it's really just uh, the ability for people to go to the front of the building and navigate through the enclosed walkway over to the memory care portion of the building. Um, we've decreased the amount of traffic by virtue of the fact that the independent living component has been removed. Um, it's been said several times that the traffic is going to be significantly reduced. Um, we are now down to uh, 23 and 31 peak AM and PM trips. So just to put that in perspective, uh, there's some 700 vehicle um, passing in front of the site every day. So if you have that volume of people traveling up and down, and I'm sure it's at peak times, uh, schools letting in and out, time people going for work, um, this, this facility really doesn't generate traffic during those periods. Um, I know that in, uh, for other facilities, uh, Wynn has uh, mentioned in, uh, in previous meetings that they try and make their uh, shift change on off-peak times. So either before the peak or after the peak so that we don't have that movement of traffic coming up and down um, the road at that point in time. Uh, the impervious area. This is a, a big factor in development. Um, the impervious area represents pavement, roof area, patios. Um, we have to capture that runoff and we have to store it uh, in order to meet the requirements of the stormwater regulation. Uh, we do not just meet the regulation, we exceed it. Our post-development runoff is less than the pre-development. So our peak flow discharge off the site will be less when we're done doing construction than when we started. So the impact to the adjacent waterway is actually a reduction. Uh, we've also increased the green space, um, made every attempt possible to put the uh, earth berm in the front of the property. That helps with screening. The plantings, uh, this is not by any means a final landscape plan. Um, but to address a couple of the comments um, that are the conditions of approval, we will be doing a final landscaping plan that will be a, a registered landscape architect, uh, provides us with all the plantings. We do use uh, native plantings and an, a combination of different colors and sizes, uh, evergreens and deciduous, so that we have a very natural looking site all year long. Uh, we would screen the areas that have been requested, both along the front and the western property lines so that as you arrive uh, near the site, it softens the site. A lot of the perspectives that we have, the trees are about a 50% opacity so you can see through them and see the building. Obviously during the summer months, those trees would provide uh, a lot of screening, as, especially as they mature. Um, so we have a side yard screening buffer. We also will be putting some plantings in the rear. Uh, the, the rear plantings are not required by the landscape ordinance, but we want to soften and make the, the site feel as natural as possible. So that's going to be included with the uh, final landscape design. Um, we've also put some rain gardens in. This is in, a, in uh, part of the regulation is to provide some water quality. Uh, that basically means that uh, the water goes into a rain garden. It's allowed to saturate down through the soil. We are able to infiltrate the water back into the ground. We're also able to evaporate some of that water up into the air through the trees, the shrubs, and just natural evaporation. That reduces our peak volume that we have to store in the back. So those ponds in the back are what's left. We, we take the water in. We store it during the rain event. 
and then we release it slowly once that peak event has occurred so that we have the minimal amount of impact as possible. Those ponds are dry ponds. They're shown with water in them. That's just for representation purposes. Uh, when a rain event's complete, the ponds completely dewater, so that we don't have any issues with uh, standing water and and uh, and you know it's it's staying saturated. Uh, the travel lane in front, we talked about that. We've reduced the parking. We've actually introduced quite a lot of walking space. So either for the residents that still can get out and walk around the facility, you can actually go around the entire facility. And uh, we've created a space between the two buildings where there's opportunity to have a gazebo, some sitting space, some natural, um, you know, natural uh, area to sit and enjoy the, the wildlife. Uh, the building is an additional 40 feet back, and the buildings all meet the required setbacks. In fact, we, we have essentially met every requirement as far as zoning uh, setbacks are concerned, and uh, we really made a lot of effort to try and adhere to every component that is set forth before us for the design. So uh, I know there was a question about the floodplain. I just want to address that now. Um, there's two components to a river. A river or stream has a floodway. The floodway is the moving water, and that is established by um, the line that's hatched. Then there's another uh, s part of the component, which is the floodplain. The floodplain is where the water comes up and spreads out. It, the water typically isn't moving, except for the edge of the floodway. Um, and we are working within the floodplain, but we've raised the building up to be uh, the required one foot above that floodplain elevation, so there's no risk of flooding. And, uh, and then we've adjusted the site to make sure that we have no work occurring within the floodway. So we've tried to make sure that we're not having an impact upstream or downstream uh, with respect to the uh, excavation and fill exercises. I think that adequately addresses the um, site development improvements that we've made from when we started to where we are today, and uh, I yield. Thank you. Again, Troy DeHaven with Smith Packet. Happy to answer any questions for you. That's the... Is that thing. complete? Complete presentation. Okay. We'll start down. Commissioner Reagan. Yes. Uh, what do you expect the intensity and um, general layout of the lighting on the property to be once it's fully developed? Uh, the township of Anderson has a, a pretty strict uh, lighting requirement. And uh, you want to? Uh, Bishop, I will say our architects designed the lighting to have the zero. I think they the name for it is the zero lot line cut off, so there's no light bleeding off of our site. It all goes into the site. Okay. And they're low, um, I, I don't know the technical terms, but they're really low impact because obviously a lot of these seniors are going to bed early. They don't want a lot of bright lights in the parking lot. That will be, uh, <laughs> um, so we develop a photometric plan. The photometric plan is developed such that we show the cutoff at the property line, the maximum intensity of the lamp and where it's located, and uh, we meet those minimum requirements. But obviously, we're trying to keep it to it's not, uh, we don't want the intensity of a used car lot. We want this to be a very low impact, uh, subtle. Uh, we use, uh, even when we use LED, we don't use a 4000K, which is a very white light. We try to bring that down into a more yellow light. Um, more consistent with uh, residential type lighting and that will be submitted as part of the land development plan. One more okay. question. Yes, uh, so uh, should this project be approved to move forward, um, what uh, sort of environmentally friendly building methods and or materials do you plan on using? As in do you plan on going for LEED certification or uh, is there any, are there any plans in that realm? All of the windows, uh, appliances, everything will be Energy Star rated. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Commissioner Eliff? Yeah, just a couple questions. Um, the uh, traffic, there's a brief letter from your consultant on the traffic. Did you guys do a um, 
I see it doesn't generate a whole lot. Did you do a comparison of what it would generate if it was developed as zoned? We didn't run the calculations based on the existing zoning. Okay. No. Because a, a layout would be, you know, open to interpretation. It could be, you know, high density with a maximum of every, uh, a house every, you know, 20,000 square feet. Or it could be larger lots with less homes on it. So it's... Well, you'd have to make some assumptions to yeah. be sure, but I was yeah. just wondering if you did it or not. We didn't, but I, I would say that the, <clears throat> the two would be similar in nature. Okay. Um, and there's a comment, uh, there's a group in Hamilton, well, in this area, I think they're limited to Hamilton County, primarily called the Hillside Trust. Did you see their letter? Well, anyway, um, th they say that the area is susceptible to erosion which is, I guess, somewhat obvious because there's the creek there. And um, the building is, I get what you're saying about you're pushing the building back, but it's, it's kind of getting into that. Uh, it's for sure in the floodplain. Um, I mean, how are you dealing with that from an engineering standpoint to um, ensure that, that uh, it's going to be a, a substantial investment so it uh, does, you know, doesn't, isn't in, impacted by a it's, flood event? It's a great question. And, um, I can say this from an engineering standpoint. My job, part of my job is to work with our geotech engineer, uh, ECS consultants. Um, they are providing us uh, full geotech support. And then we use uh, best engineering practices to make sure that we protect both the investment, uh, the Smith packet, and uh, make sure that there's no danger to the, for, for the erosion. Um, so it is being engineered and evaluated as we go along. And uh, those provisions will be in place. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I have a few questions. Uh, the dumpster you show is enclosure, but there's something to the west of the dumpster. Is that a generator? That's correct, yes. Okay. Emergency generator. And will that generator also be enclosed? Uh, yes. To meet the township requirements as far as material and height and things that like that? That is correct, yes. Fully enclosed. How often is that generator exercised? It has to be exercised every 30 days. Um, and, you know, that's a requirement to make the generator certification, uh, but it would be for a brief amount of time, 30 to 60 minutes, uh, to make sure that it operates correctly in the event of an emergency. Okay. And that will be exercised on sort of day daytime hours? Or? That would be the intent, yes. Okay. Um, I see you have a, a lo unloading and loading area, you know, to the south, yes. but there's really no landscape buffer to the south on the other side of the drive? Would you be willing to add, you know, evergreen trees and more landscaping at that point? It's where that swale comes through also yes. to buffer that land loading zone from the residences to the south. Are you yeah, hop in there. Right here? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> there is an existing swale, so we can't go into that area, but yeah, we have, we're showing um, the memory care patio here and the assisted living patio here. So th there'll be uh, landscaping in front of both yeah, and help screen it. Looking at the south side of your drive? Uh, up here? Yeah, right there. yeah. Right. We, we'll definitely screen it um, from the building. This, this is not a load to make sure we don't have an erosion problem, but anytime we can limit the amount of focus flow and return it back to sheet flow and slow that water down, allow it to absorb back into the ground, uh, it's better for everyone. I guess what's the parking ratio between residents, employees, and visitors of the spaces that have been identified? Can you speak to that, Troy? Um, let's see. We we have 122 units, and we're parking in 84 uh, parking spaces. So how many of those in a given day are employees? How many of them do you anticipate being residents? Uh, again, memory care residents don't drive at all, so that's 32 units that no cars are needed. Most of our assisted living residents don't drive after a couple of years. Um, even if they were to move in with a car, after a couple of years, they tend to use our shuttle service. So probably more heavily towards em employee parking, which we've pushed to the back of the building. Okay. 
yeah. how many employees maximum employees so on a shift so i think shift, i think yeah. our the first shift would be the maximum employees and and i think you oftentimes will start that shift at 7 a.m to avoid some of the peak traffic times and mm -hmm. that it, we can vary that but typically 30 is about the most we would have at, at full occupancy of employees yeah for we have three different shifts so on your first shift you may have 30 to 35 vehicles second shift probably a little bit less and third shift very minimal um, also you had mentioned about the delivery trucks and so I wanted to clarify what we do is we limit it to one food delivery per week so we pick one day it's during the day um, and we do that for several different reasons but there is only one delivery truck per week for food and that's the only large delivery truck that we have okay. and then looking at the berm across the, along Clough Pike it's very continuous. Is there any way you could make it a little more sculptural and overlap, but still provide the same height as far as screening? Absolutely. To, you know, sort of soften it from um, sort of the racetrack look? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we would plant it. But because we're extending the right of way, which is part of the agreement to provide that 100 foot right of way, the 50 foot on either side. Um, then what we've got, we've already got a cut in there that allows us to bring our um, existing drainage swell through there. So we could put some overlaps in and, and break that up and, and make it more attractive. This was purely to get it on a plan. Um, you know, so there's a number of things we can do to, to, to address that, yes. Yeah, we, we will put flowers, things like that on it, small plants. Just unfortunately, we're not allowed to plant the bigger trees that you see behind it. So we'll dress it up. Uh, that's all the question I have. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so starting <coughs> starting with the berm, that was going to be my question is why you, you can't plant. I mean, I understand the county engineer doesn't allow you to put trees within the right-of-way. Um, <coughs> and you're putting the berm in the right-of-way. Um, but they will certainly let you put shrubs, native grasses, all of those kinds of things in there. So obviously we would expect to see that. And as my fellow commissioner said, um, the straight straight line berm is um, not particularly aesthetically pleasing. Can I, can I answer one thing there? And that's maybe in Paul's realm. We would certainly love to plant that berm with trees. We've been told that more than likely that 50 foot of right of way will never come in play. But you know it's that's not our decision but it would look better for us it would screen the building better it would give us the opportunity to have more variety of plantings if we did plant the berm and then if there was ever extended out it could just be take we could take it out did, did you, you ask know. them about a perpetual easement yeah. did, did we use the word perpetual easement paul i don't remember but i don't know that the county has made a final determination yet yeah i mean the county has granted me easements previously mm -hmm. um to allow us to plant my clients to plant with them right away so um, if if we're allowed ask the right question yeah. ask the right people. okay we'll do that if we're allowed to do it we certainly would want to plant that berm um, I, I was a little confused about the um, stormwater management system because um, it was repeatedly referred to as ponds but yet on the site plan it's referred to as a detention basin and ponds and detention is the opposite they are sort of interchangeable the difference obviously is one detains water and drains out completely retention or ponds hold some water in there so these are detention. So they yeah. hold the water during the storm and then drain out completely. Yeah, they're detention basins, they're not ponds. So I think you need to get your language straight there. With yep, I'll take that. care of that. Um, and uh, so how, explain to us how, how that works. How does the detention work that it's in the floodplain? So you have a heavy storm. And right. So explain to us how that works. So the, both ponds, the one on the left of your plan required to be captured. And, and, but I guess the, the fact that they're in the floodplain doesn't play into it at all? No, and that's another reason that we've put them down into existing ground so that there isn't a fear of a wash away event, you know, and like I said, that you don't have to be concerned with the pond being ruptured or anything to that, that and, effect. And how do you intend to treat the, the basin itself? To treat the basin? Are you going to plant it? Are you going to um, the sides of it, the upper sides? Is there going to be a concrete spillway? What's the... Okay, yes, so the, uh, the outlet structure s resides in the pond itself, and then there is an emergency spillway. The emergency spillway is typically a uh, gabion basket, riprap, um, reinforced spillway with a one foot of freeboard, which means that you have to uh, design for a foot of overflow in the event of that very large storm. And but the size of it itself, is it gonna be mowed or? It would be a grass, um, 
type construction. Um, the requirements do have some plantings in the bottom um, to try and get some benefit from infiltration and the evaporation, like I said, about the, uh, the rain gardens. So yes. You know, but sometimes the they do tend to hold water in the bottom and that becomes a mosquito trap. Yep, and we try to dewater them completely for that very reason, and, and those plantings do help us to achieve that. Um, in terms of the, the actual facility itself, where is your closest facility? Do you, do you bring any pictures of any of your existing facilities? I didn't bring any. Um, what's the, what would be your closest? Um, so we, um, I think our closest facilities right now we're doing um, several over in Pittsburgh area. Um, this would be our first one in Ohio. We have done in our past when our, our company was started, we did a lot of um, skilled nursing facilities, a lot in Ohio, but this is our first facility of this type in Ohio. But we've got um, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, all, all the way down to Florida, up to Delaware, um, the D.C. area, um, Pittsburgh, West Virginia, um, and um, where else I may be forgetting now, but Indiana. yeah, going over to Indiana, Tennessee, Tennessee. Tennessee. have quite a few in Tennessee. Where are you, are, do you have skilled facilities here in Cincinnati? Skilled we do facilities? not have any skilled facilities okay. currently in okay. Cincinnati. Okay. Um, so can you just kind of walk us through the units? I mean, are these, what's the average age of the resident? What's the average length of stay? Um, do you do a lot of rehab patients? Um, what are the units like? I mean, pull cords, you know, the, that yeah, kind uh, of let, I'll let Bob sure. answer that. He's the expert sure. on it. Sure. Sure. So um, our typical resident um, average age is about 84, 85 years old, um, mostly female. And um, with this kind of community, we have now with our independent living community, some of those residents are a little bit younger than that. But with, with this community, they would be about 85 or so. Um, it's interesting. We see residents coming in later and later and staying home longer and longer. So it's not uncommon to have someone who's 90 years old to come in to one of our communities. But what we provide is we have a variety of floor plans and they're studio, one bedroom, two bedroom apartments. So people will choose what apartment they like and then they receive certain amenities by being in the community. So they receive three meals a day. So we were, what we do is we serve meals restaurant style. We try to source um, some fruit, food locally. It's important for us to try to not only source food locally, but to try to use local vendors. I mean, that makes sense for us. I think it's good for the, um, for the um, local economy as well. And so I think that is something in terms of our food program, our residents, it, residents move in to our community basically for three reasons. One is because maybe they're not cooking very well and maybe they're, they're having a compromised nutritional you know, status. Another is that they take medications and maybe they can't remember to take all their medications. But the third thing, which is really interesting, is isolation. Um, and there's so many studies that link, you know, mortality rates to isolation and depression to isolation. And some of our residents, you know, they, they stay in one room in their, in their house for the last 10 years. And um, son and daughter come home during the holidays and see them there and say, gosh, mom and dad, they're just not active. And so when they come into our communities, they come, in, they come into our communities and not only do they have lunch, breakfast, and dinner, but they have a full array of activities all day long. So they have exercise classes, they'll have yoga, they'll have dissertations that people will come and provide, we'll have book reading clubs, we'll have cooking events, um, we will do outings, like I said, to local restaurants. So we provide a variety of activities. We'll bring um, small children will come in to do like um, like during Christmas time to sing Christmas carols, we'll bring in professional entertainment. Um, we do charity events where we bring in entertainment during the holidays and invite the community and partner with the charity. So it's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity. You can do as little or as much as you want. It's really kind of up to you. Um, and we try to get people involved. Um, we have cooking events. We have, um, we have the normal card games. We actually do have bingo too. People like bingo a lot. Um, but we try to offer a lot of other things too, like, um, like uh, painting. Um, and I'd say our most popular event is happy hour, um, I think. So we have a bistro, and so our most popular event is happy hour for our memory care residents, not for our, I'm, I'm sorry, for our assisted living residents. For our memory care, that's a little different story. For memory care, what we do is we have actually what's called, um, we have structured programs every day. If you come into our assisted, live, or to our memory care neighborhood, 
what's offered each day is very consistent and that's very important so there's structured programming but it's great programming it's it's we do a lot of music and memory um, we do reminiscing um, we will do a lot of singing we do um, walks out in the garden um, we take our our, assist, our memory care residents out to some events we have enough um, sort of supervision to be able to do that so just trying to provide a great quality of life and get people involved um, and so that's kind of what they can experience we also provide housekeeping um, and we provide laundry and I think that's it we also have a concierge 24 hours that is for safety and security um, also all residents have equipped in their room an emergency pool cord so God forbid they need anything they they pull it and they also have a pendant we have a pendant system which it will track a resident if they're somewhere and they fall down and they need assistance we can they they push their pendant and we can help find them and so and then we also bring in we have on-site physical therapy and we have a, a fitness room but we have on-site physical therapy we have traveling phy um, physicians um, and so that what we can do is make sure that we're trying to meet all of the needs of the residents emotional physical spiritual intellectual health all of those things under one roof What's the average length of stay? Average length of stay is about 18 months. Um, With independent living, it's about three years. About three years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not all because people going to a higher level of care. Sometimes it is. Some, sometimes people go home. They will go home too. But most of the time, it's people unfortunately either passing away or needing like skilled nursing facilities. Um, and I'm assuming each unit has like a mini kitchen. Um, yeah, great question. So what it has, it has what we call like a kitchenette. So it will have, um, it will have a sink and it will have a microwave. It will have cabinets. Um, we, we don't have stoves um, because we provide the meals. We want them to come down. To yes, socialization. we do. Okay. And then the, the building materials, we've talked about siding. Is that hardy plank? Oh, I will have to turn that over um, to these gentlemen. Um, I do want to go up to one question that you had early, or just a few moments ago. If you go on Harmony Senior Services, it does have all of our uh, communities has renderings and floor plans that you can look at. As far as the building materials, yeah, we're not going to use vinyl signing. It'll be hardy board, as mentioned. There'll be wood elements and stone. Um, and then you said the average number of employees on the ship. And there are other positions too. There are, you know, there are. Uh, we have a we have a chef who runs our dining program. We have lead cooks. We have regular cooks. Um, we have utility cooks. We have housekeepers that work full time. Um, and we have maintenance director, we have assistant maintenance director, we have those kind of positions as well. Okay. Um, just one other I was going to ask you, which I wrote down. Um, oh, EMS runs. Yeah, good question. Good question. So, um, so for, for us, we partner with the local EMSs and um, emergency rooms. And what we do is when a resident has an issue that occur that let's say for instance a resident falls down which we have residents that unfortunately will fall we can assess and then we make the determination whether or not we call 911 I think a little bit of a difference from us as compared to if it was just a residential setting if you're in your own residential setting and you fall you know your family might be calling 911 every time we will assess first we have professionals there that will assess and we will we will only use 911 and EMS judiciously and that's what they prefer as well but but we make that known to our families and there are a few different injuries that we use 911 as a rule um, but for most of the things that happen with our residents we can assess and determine if it's just a um, if it's just a, a routine visit to the doctor that needs to happen or if I actually need to go out 911 great I think the uh, other commissioners have taking my topics and I appreciate that so at this time um, we're going to ask that uh, anyone that has to sort of a housekeeping role if you will any persons willing to wishing to speak uh, will be permitted one at a time whether for or against the application we'll start with those that are for when speaking each person from the audience must come forward to the podium speak into the microphone state their name address and any affiliation with the case all persons speaking will be limited to three minutes. All comments are directed to the commission only. No comments or questions are to be directed to the applicant or anyone else in the audience. The commission will only hear new, non-repetitive evidence or questions. So at this time, anyone wishing to speak for the applicant? You want to tell them about time? 
Yeah, we did three minutes. And uh, Brad, you will operate the clock. Are you speaking for? Please come forward, state your name and address and any affiliation. Hi, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you um, for being here this evening. Um, my name is Kathleen Motes Thamen, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of history since I am a member of the Kinder 8 LLC, which was formed um, to liquidate the assets of my mom's estate. And so um, she died a couple of years ago, and my siblings and I have formed um, this was formed um, to kind of be a vehicle to disperse her estate, and I just wanted to express my um, personal and professional um, experience with what it's like to have an aging, you know, family member um, who then passed away living in Anderson Township. And so my mom was Carolyn Moat. She lived um, across the street from the property at 6344 Clough Pike. And um, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago, she broke her hip. At that time, we searched um, high and low for beds to be able to provide rehabilitation services for her to be able to nurse her back to health, so to speak. Um, we ended up um, having to provide those services in a facility that was not located in Anderson Township. We actually ended up in um, a facility that was close to Fields Ertle, which was very far away from where she lived, outside of her comfort zone, um, and put all of us uh, um, at a disadvantage in terms of being able to be there on a regular and consistent basis to ensure that her care was properly, um, that she was well cared for and that her needs were met. Um, I am a social worker and um, have also seen the need for assisted living and senior living options. Um, some of my friends who work for the Council on Aging and other um, agencies that serve the aging population um, certainly um, can also relate personal stories to be able to address the need for additional living facilities for senior citizens in Anderson Township. So when I looked at um, the data from the um, census, which is already eight or nine years old, there um, were some interesting facts that came to light when I looked at that data. In, um, in one of the, the data that I thought was interesting is as follows. 13% of the population of Anderson Township aged 65 or older 22% are age 50 to 64, 22% are 35 to 49, 12% are between 20 and 34 years of age, and 30% are under the age of 21. To make, um, I'll bring my point to a close. Thank you. I um, noticed from that data that we all know that Anderson Township is a great place to raise a family that the majority of the people are um, probably close to my age and have children that are in the school systems that is well documented that it has an excellent reputation for that. What was missing though was the availability of senior citizens to be able to continue to live in a community in which we grow up in. And so from that data you can extrapolate you know 10 years, 20 years from now you know, those families, which are the majority of the families living in Anderson Township, you know, we are looking at where are we going to live in addition to where our parents are um, having options to live. And so I think that okay. as... Thank you. Okay. I think we know. We uh, appreciate your input. Thank you very Thank much. You. Anyone else speaking for? Please come forward, state your name, address, affiliation. Hi, my name is Sharon Scott. I live at 8167 Woodruff Road in Anderson Township, lifelong resident of the township and the village of Newtown. Um, I do know the Motes family. I have known them my entire life since the day I was born. Um, gone to church with them, school with them, know all of the family. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of this, again, to reiterate that 
we at the township do not have enough senior options. Um, my father just recently passed away in May from Alzheimer's. Uh, my mother was the main caregiver. Fortunately, she was in very good health, but it did take a very physical toll on her. She did, towards the end, get some daytime care. But if she would have not been in a physical good condition, um, you know, I'm not sure where they would have gone or what we would have done. Because most places are, like the New England Club is independent and assisted living, but no memory care. Arden Courts is only memory care. The new Stonecrest, I believe, is indep or not independent. It will only be assisted and memory care. Um, it's unfortunate that this place will not have the independent care, because that would have been fantastic to have independent, assisted, and memory in one facility. Because again, you have people who have been married for over 50 years, close to 60 years, but yet they need that help. One may need memory help, one may need assisted living, but they don't want to live apart. They still want to live together. So I, I don't think this market is saturated at all. I think it is definitely needed in this township. Again, my mother has lived in the village of Newtown her entire life. If I was going to go put her somewhere, I, I don't want to have to look to Sharonville or Kenwood or Madeira or Montgomery to put her somewhere where her family is not convenient. She would not get visited at, as often. There needs to be a place here for her, the place that she grew up in, the place that she wants to die in. You know, this is it. Luckily, she's in great health. She's still at home. We haven't had to make that decision at any time. Um, so I, again, I'm for this vote. I feel that if it has met any and all requirements that the township has put on it, then it should be approved. Um, I'm just, I, I know Jay's familiar. They put a subdivision behind my house on Woodruff Road. I think you all asked more questions about this than you did putting the 34 houses behind my house with the noise level, which you took all the trees out. And you're worried about a box truck that's going to come once a week. I'm sorry. I don't think that's much of a noise issue. So, But thank you. I hope you approve it because it is definitely needed for this aging community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anyone else wishing to speak for the proposal? Please come forward, state your name and address, and any affiliation. My name is Jean Bolte. I live at 8816 in Court in Westchester. Um, I live there. I'm I'm here representing the owners. I'm one of the one of the eight members of Kinder Eight, and I just want to point out, you know, you've all heard the presentation that Smith Packett has given, and I just want to reiterate that, you know, they listen. Their, the whole redesign of their plans is it, it was due in part because of the concerns raised at the public meetings. And so looking back, um, you know, you know, with the planning board in Hamilton County, they do respond. And just from a personal level, as one of the trustees, we have been interacting with um, the Smith, Smith Packet staff for, you know, well over a year now. And we have found that Whatever they have said to us, they, you know, they've honored their words. So they, um, they're, they, we really believe that they want to make a good facility that contributes to our community. And um, we just want to, so I just wanted to just reiterate that, you know, they're, whatever, they, whatever they've promised to us, they have fulfilled. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. I wasn't. I didn't come here to speak tonight, but with this conversation, please give your away. name, address. I'm Norma please. Brown. Yeah. I live in Turpin Hills, 6015 Stirrup Road. I'm a real estate agent in the area for 40 years. So, I just want to state that in the last three months, I have moved three clients from Turpin Hills to assisted living places. And that's one neighborhood. And one had to go to Dare Park, one had to go to Hyde Park, one is over by the Dupree. These are people who would love to have stayed in the neighborhood, 
who have family in the neighborhood, it's very difficult for them to now have to move to a place where their, their family's not there, their friends aren't there, they've lived in Turpin 20 plus years, all three of them. So um, it's a difficult decision because I understand the other side also. But I do think we have a, we have a huge need in this community for um, assisted living and also independent living. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, at this time we'll open up for anyone who's speaking against the proposal. Please come forward. I don't have any certain order. We'll just go as... So. My name is Rick Benkin. I live at 6011 Clough Pike. I'm less than a thousand yards west of this new building they're talking about. If you don't have any history, I've lived in Anderson Township on the same property for 65 years. The property just west of your building there, if you had it where the Turpin Meadows or whatever they call it now, is um, there used to be 24 units less than 100 feet from that residual pond and that curve. It's now gone. It's washed down. It's down by my place, some of the bricks. If you go down uh, basically 500 feet or 500 yards downstream, you'll see because a few trees fell down because all the erosion we have, because the planning has not done its job and these retention pools don't work. It's calling, Clough Pike's going to be in trouble. It's going to wash out. Just west of this, or just east of that, where that curve is, you used to be able to, when you hydroplane on Clough Pike, you had a chance. But now you hydroplane where that corner is, you'd go into Clough Creek. They don't plan on people visiting these people with those parking spaces. And they don't have a heliport to get those people out of there because if you've been in Anderson Township and Clough Pike is one of the major roads, major traffic jams. It's backed up all the way to my mailbox most of the time. If you have a business upstream, it's ridiculous to get the life squad down there. It ain't going to happen. Traffic is just crazy. There's no, I don't know where they got their thing saying 700 cars a day. There's 700 an hour in rush hour traffic. You don't dare walk across Clough Pike without looking both ways twice. And even then, you could get run over. My mailbox gets wiped out all the time because people are slamming on their brakes and skid in. This is not a good idea. There's just, uh, and the 100 year flood was supposedly 82. Since then, my front yard's basically been flooded about eight times. 250 feet of water in my front yard because it floods. The erosion, if you look down, if you get the bigger map, you'll see where Clough Creek is coming out towards Clough Pike. So Clough Pike's going to go underwater unless they do something. They haven't done anything. I don't know if the Army Corps of Engineers can do anything for you guys, but right next to that property line, it's washing out. Across, 100 feet across, there was an apartment building. It was washed out, flushed. And downstream, like I said, 500 yards maybe, You'll see that Clough Creek has come over 120 feet. Bad idea. Thank you. Paul, can you put up a different map that shows more of the area? So we can identify where people actually reside? Yeah. And can you make a point on the map? There. There you go. That's better. And we'll make a pointer available. So. Behind you, you can see the red box coming down. Where the swimming pool is, there was an apartment building that had 24 units and it was washed out. All right. If you look down 500 yards downstream there, you'll see where it's coming towards Club Pike. This is an old overhead. If you get out of Club Pike and you can see 
the erosion. So if a certain sycamore falls, it's going to come and eat out just like it did there. It wants to stop it from changing. Once this fails, to stop it from, is there any guarantees it's not going to be changed to a meth rehab like they did in Bridgetown, Finneytown, and uh, uh, over on Colway? They had one of these that failed. It became a meth rehab joint. I don't like that. Okay, thank you. We'll just work our way back, and if you, want, if you can move up, if you want. Okay. Hi, I'm Bonnie Collins. I live at 1598 Mears Avenue in Mount Washington. However, I lived in Anderson Township for about 20 years. We own six acres. We raised a pig. My daughters went through high school, went from kindergarten through high school, so I love Anderson Township. However, <laughs> um, I want to thank Anderson Township for considering and looking into um, housing for seniors. I'm going to be 78 in a couple months, so I have to look at these places and think I might be there someday. Where do I want to be? And I love Anderson Township, so I want to be there. Um, and I, the only thing is, I don't like destroying property. I don't like being having it built on a place where it's going to destroy the vegetation. Um, is the road going to be expanded? Is it still going to be just a little tiny cleft pike? Um, I couldn't hear half of the conversation back here, so I probably bring it up stuff. Um, I don't like the earth burns. It makes me think of Columbia Parkway with, you know, falling down, you know, with the rain. And the traffic, I'm th I can think of a hundred things that, reasons why people could be going to that place <laughs> is there'd be family visiting, there'd be employees, there'd be uh, personal care uh, people, there'd be physicians coming there. Um, EMS, I can't imagine that coming on that narrow road <laughs> with all the traffic. Um, there's going to be cooking, you know, people to cook, uh, caregivers, transportation for the residents will be using that. Um, so that that's my concerns. I mean, I love the idea of more senior housing. We're going to need it. I know that. But I just don't like that spot. There's got to be a better spot that's not going to do so much negative impact on, a, on the area. Okay, thank you. Come forward. Hello. My name is Guy Wolf, and I'm at 6001 Stirrup in Anderson Township, uh, just off the picture of the map up there. Um, I think we're missing a great opportunity. I don't think anyone would stand up here and say they're against the uh, benefits of senior housing or the need for it. Uh, so it's too bad we're, we're either for or against it or appear that way when we oppose this kind of development. And the opportunity that we're missing is blending something into this neighborhood. Um, and it's unfortunate that we had a, a ruling that was on pro forma uh, a couple weeks ago or last week by the county uh, with compliance. Because if you actually read what is written here by very skilled staff, and I'll just quote a, a small extract, the proposed size, intensity, and density of the proposed institutional use is even greater than the adjacent apartment complex. This would cause a step up in intensity for the property rather than a step down as you would expect in a transitional area. So what we're missing is the opportunity to do some development that actually uh, meshes with, with the community, that represents a transition, a step down from the central business district into the open space and the residential. Uh, I, th I think it's unfortunate because we seem to be married to a developer that has one image of how to input or, or how to implement senior housing, and that's not the only option out here. Um, if this is approved, uh, the other downside of this if, is now we have moved our commercial development line and what is acceptable along Clough Creek. 
so that the next presentation that comes up here in a year, in two years, three years, will use this as the new baseline for what more to develop along Clough Creek. And there is absolutely no shortage of developers willing to put uh, more development in there. Thank you. Thank you. Saw his hand first. Hi, I'm Tony Becker. I, I live at 6104 Clough. You can just see my house, the top top corner there. And I, I just I brought Sorry. photos. Is it Tony Becker. Tony Becker, yes. And you may have gotten these photos. I sent them to you to the board. Um, Did you send them to to staff? I sent them to Sarah, and hope, hopefully she shared them with you. But is there something you can call up that I don't see here? Okay. This is erosion that's happening. Uh, you mentioned the erosion problem. That's happening right now, not upstream, downstream, right where they're talking about a curve. That's right, right there on the property. There's another apartment building about to fall in right at that house over there, right at the southern tip there on the other side. <coughs> This is a pump that's, that's going out of the apartment building. Yeah, there. Every time there's a rain. Um, and this is this is across the street from me. This is this is not happening. This didn't happen ten years ago. This happened last within the last few years. Uh, this is a dynamic watershed area. It's constantly changing and evolving. Um, this, this property does not, will not exist in a, in a problem. The, the engineer talked about, you know, uh, uh, what was the phrase he used? Um, slope reinforcement. Any of that kind of thing is going to harden the landscape and make, make the water move more quickly. Um, and that's not even mentioned when, when the flood does, the 100 year flood does happen, the 500 year flood. Mm -hmm. um, there are dead trees all the way all along here that are falling into the creek. So this this is not something that's static and unchanging. What was this picture of? That's the apartment building, right? No, this this one right in here. That's the pump. Right okay. In front of the, of it, as you cross the bridge there. You guys familiar with the, the apartment building complex? Yes. You come to the bridge, hard left, it's right there. And that's that's running every time there's a storm. It's a quiet pump. That's not my issue. It's just that it's there, probably emptying basements. Um, and um, so, you know, none of us dispute the need for the for this housing. I've been to parents' study in the last few years, and we we were really hard pressed to find really meaningful places for them to be at. It's just not here. This is not the location for it. Um, so that's. You can keep those photos. I think. I can show you. This is a, this is this is 20, 30 feet of, of drainage pipe that's fallen in within the last within the last year and a half, two years. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Please come forward. I promise we'll get to everybody. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is David Costa, 6753 Tree Ridge. I'm a general contractor, residential co general contractor by trade, and I uh, so I have no um, problems with development by any means. Um, but I would like to say that um, I'm also a volunteer naturalist with the Nature Center in Claremont County and have learned a lot about um, this piece of property based on my knowledge from there. And I can tell you, and I can send you guys the link if you'd like to see it, um, that Ohio has a headwater, um, um, it's a program, it's really nifty. You can click on a spot in Hamilton County and you can see where all the water comes from. The water that comes off this roof goes down through the, this property that we're talking about. And it's just um, being a resident of um, treetops, as you know, there's a lot of property around Lawyer and treetops that have had slides over the years. And um, so there's a, the, the geotechnical aspect that they said they've uh, also considered. But 
we are in a glacier till area. Everything from, the, from Canada has stopped here because it's as far as it's gone. So there's a lot of geotechnical things as well to consider. I don't buy that um, a piece of property that size that's naturally vegetated would be able to, would um, run more water off than this property after. I would like to see that document and consider that before you make the decision on this property. Again, reverting back to the other people that have come up here and talked about stormwater. Um, the, 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 um, and as we know, every time we develop anything, there's more and more water that ha doesn't have any place to go and it's all got to come down through there. So that's a, just a word of warning. And then my final thing, just from a natural beauty standpoint, I don't think people realize how important a piece of property is like that. If I had, you know, $20 million, I would buy the property and donate to Anderson Township so that, you know, the pollinators and all the other pl uh, plants and animals would have some place to um, do their business. So I know that sounds, you know, sky in the pie, but I think it's important. So anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Please come forward. Who's next? You're up. Please come forward. My name is David Rudder. I live at 7393 Lawyer Road. I'm going to take you back to July 28, 2016. We had nearly four and a half inches of rain in just under two hours. Um, Clough Pike at Berkshire flooded and 12 people needed rescuing during that time. Now during that particular rain event, I don't know if this property flooded. It wasn't in the news, probably because there are no buildings there, there are no people there. Our rainfall is increasing as we're going through time. We know this, we see this. The 100 year flood is no longer, really can be called the 100 year flood and the past is not a predictor of what future conditions are going to be anymore. So taking some of our most vulnerable residents and putting them into the 100-year floodplain is probably not a good idea. So I would just urge you, we definitely need this type of development in Anderson Township, but again, as it's been said, this is probably not the best location for that, putting the most vulnerable people into harm's way. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Erin Cox. I live at 5880 Turpin Hills Drive. Um, so I, uh, I'm in agreement with what everybody has said that we definitely could use to, you know, an assisted living facility, but question the location as well. Um, at the end of the day, the deterioration basins that are brought up are essentially being suggested as a way to mitigate flooding, which it sounds like they will do for their property. But the question is, it doesn't really help Clough Creek. It doesn't help the erosion, and it doesn't help those that surround us. It has nothing to do with solving those issues that we're seeing happening. So it does help them but it doesn't help the rest of us as residents here. And so I feel like you need to look further. I'm not an expert in it, but I do think that it's worth looking at the Google time lapse and see the amount of erosion that takes place when you watch that time lapse video, how far back and how quickly Clough Creek is deteriorating. And this property definitely will be impacted over time by that. Further, I think that you have to go past people who have vested interest and their opinion and invite people who are experts in the arena, who um, have no reason or nothing to gain from seeing this go through. So I'm hoping Adam Lehman, who is here from the Hamilton County Water and Soil Conservation District, where this is his expertise, has a moment to share with us his suggestions about the deterioration of the riparian zone within Clough Creek as we watch it start to um, basically get washed away and eaten away, what his suggestion is, what proactive steps we can take to protect it. Further, for your consideration, if unfortunately this does go through and you do choose to uh, change the zoning and allow this to happen, that their suggestion for sidewalk 
in between one driveway interest and another does not seem like it's really giving back to the community. If you do choose to do so, why would it not be connecting the existing sidewalk on Newtown all the way down to the existing sidewalk in front of Turpin Hills Drive? That would be in alignment with what the vision is for Anderson Township. And so I think that should be a higher standard is being asked when you're, when you're having somebody come into the community like this. I think those are the two things that I really want to talk about. Thank you. That's Adam over there. Okay. Yeah. Next. Who is next? Just come forward, please. Hi. I'm Adam Lehman. I'm the stream specialist with Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, I, w I want to be clear that I'm not here to make a position for or against on the behalf of the district. I'm here to share information with the commission. I'm here to offer a recommendation and, and my assistance to the, the developer should this go through. So, you know, I've had residents reach out to me with concerns of this creek and, you know, I've done site visits on this creek. I've, I've been to that property right there where you can, you can just see it's a mess, right? So the question is, is if this development goes through following current stormwater regulations, will it contribute to the deterioration of, and erosion in the street? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and so why is that? That's because our current stormwater regulations are designed for flood mitigation and to a lesser extent water quality mitigation. So, you know, a lot of people, that they think about urbanization and stream bank erosion and they think that these large events coming through are what's tearing up the channel and it's actually uh, more nuanced than that. It's, it's a case where the increased frequency of these smaller events, smaller than bank full events, is, is what's contributing to the destabilization of the stream. And so the thing is, we can design these detention facilities to handle this. Now neither the township nor the county can, can force them to do this. But if, if they so chose, they could design their basins, the outfall structures. It wouldn't even probably have to be an increased size for detention capacity. It just, you, we have to have the, that outfall structure designed to release what we would call a critical discharge at a lesser frequency than, than what, what basically we can't, we can't contribute to a critical discharge. So if there's a critical discharge going on in the stream, we cannot add to that. So it's an engineering exercise. You know, I appreciate that, you know, they, they've apparently gone above and beyond for their, their, um, their detention volume. They've gone above and beyond for, for how slow it's released. But that's, that's flooding concerns. Right? The, to do this right, we need to have a, a coarse watershed model. We need to have a geomorphic survey of the stream, and, and we, it could be done right. So, you know, my, that, that offer stands. I, I'd be glad to offer my assistance in, in seeing that this is done right if it were to, to be approved. Okay, thank you. We didn't get an address. Uh, we need an ad address for you. And I'm can we just please hold the applause? Just some people did not get applause, and I don't want them to feel bad. You just need an address. 1325 East Kemper Road. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Good evening. My name is uh, Alfred Thien, and my house is uh, behind the uh, reserve turbine community monument, just the, the house behind the monument. Uh, I've been here there for 18 years. Do you have an address, sir? I'm sorry? And an actual address? 631, 6310, Carperty Flint. Okay, thank you. I've been there for 18 years. In the past 18 years, we lost about five to six feet to the bank. And I have uh, 30 feet left to my building. And uh, when the uh, flood water come in, we see 2,000 pounds of the rocks or concrete flowing down like a baby seat, car seat. And in this summer, we know, everybody knows there's car flowing, flowing down from upper stream to downstream. Some of them may lost their life in stream. 
And my concern is that when the construction site build up, the flood level and the speed will increase. There are three factors involved in. First, it's a hard surface created. That surface is not reduced. Even though they go to down two story level, the surface would be the same. Second is the uh, retaining water pond. That pond is not sufficient. It may be good for about two inches within two hours. How about, do you have a rain come down days and days? And, days? and third is the uh, retaining wall in the, in the creek. They are going to build up a concrete wall or borders with the concrete that will increase speed level and plus it would, it would put water to the, to the wrong side, south, south stream. So uh, I have uh, actually, I sent an email to Hamilton County Project Manager for the plan, the administrator, uh, administrator Greg Samori, and he sent me an email next day that when, after I, we went to a county meeting. I hope when we, uh, the board member make a decision, please put uh, our situation in your suit and think about the, uh, what we are facing now. Here is the, uh, the email I received from him. And next page is the calculation that I did to reflect what's going to happen when rain comes down within hours and days, based on what they, ha they have, the uh, proposal. It may have a 10-20% margin, but uh, it would be, uh, be uh, something to consider about factors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Please come forward all the way up. Thank you. Ma'am, you just wait a second? Just come on up to the microphone. Yes. And please state your name and address. My name is Sherry He's my husband. Okay, please come forward. Thank yeah. you. So I just want to add a few words. When I just bought this house 18 years ago, and I, when I bought this, I asked the sales. I said, hey, there is a creek here. So is that anything? It's like, I concern flood. You know, uh, I was told, uh, I mean, she said, it's uh, for past the 100 years, nothing, nothing wrong. So no flood. So but right now, you know, whenever we have a heavy rain, the, the creek, just like big uh, river, the, you know, the water goes very high. So we have to buy the flood insurance. So that's what, you know, that's why we're always concerned about that. Yeah, that's only the few words. OK, thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. Uh, yeah, hello, uh, my name is Jerry Gilden. I live at 6130 Clough Pike. And you can actually see my house on that screen up there. Um, one of the things that's been overlooked to some extent here is the sheer value of that entrance, the west entrance of Clough Pike. Uh, I've had visitors come through and say, wow, you know, going snaking up through the hill, a lot of old historic homes, beautiful landscaping, you know, then suddenly if we go ahead with a project like this, it's going to detract from that value. And this affects us all in Anderson Township. You know, it's not only the people in the immediate area, but it's all the folks down the road and uh, in adjacent uh, properties. So, you know, when I look at the architectural drawings, I say to myself, my God, that thing isn't really very inspiring at all. It's plain, it's three stories high, it sits as a monstrosity on our way into Anderson Township, and this is going to detract from our properties. So at that, you know, I'll leave you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Support. Hi, 
I'm Vianne Wright, I live at 2155 Berkshire Club Drive, and none of you will spell my first or my last names correctly, but that's okay. Anyway, um, I just want to say, I don't know who did the traffic study, because I live on Berkshire Club, so I'm a block from Clough Pike. But every day around 4 o'clock, if I was thinking about turning right out of the subdivision, I live in the first house up off of uh, Corbley. Uh, if I was thinking about turning right and then going down to Clough Pike to go towards the hospital or whatever, I go out the back way and take back roads because there is so much traffic. There is much more than 700 cars a day. And I think a lot of good points have been made about not, not about having senior citizen housing. You've heard all of that. Everybody wants that. But just not there. And it's the traffic. It's the environment. I think people have made, it's, it's the fact that once you change uh, zoning there, then it's going to be someplace else and someplace else. And that relates to all those things about people talking about the beauty of people coming into that gateway of the township. So hopefully you'll bring all these things together and make the right decision for the whole township. Thank you. Please come forward. Thank you for hearing me. My name is Daryl Meyerinke, and I live at 6015 Clough Pike. It's a green roofed house right there on the left side. And um, basically, and I also own the Family Pet Center, which is right down the street. On Clough. So I've got two interests. <laughs> Um, number one, the traffic. Okay, the traffic uh, today when I came here, turned right out of the parking lot because my business is on the other side of the street, up through Royal Green, which everybody in Royal Green would hate if I lived there, people cutting through. But little dry run, wolf angle, and up to here, okay, because traffic was so bad. Since the sidewalk project has taken place, it's beautified the area, but traffic has been bad in the evening times, especially. Later school start helps a little bit, but we have traffic issues, traffic big issues, I think, in the business district of Clough Pike. Um, these guys talked about having 40 employees at first shift, 30 employees at the second shift, and those people are overlapping. That's, set, that's 70 vehicles right there, not counting the number of residents they have. That's a couple hundred more cars at least that are going to be traveling that road various times of the day. But I have to say that uh, change of shift is probably going to be um, you know, pretty close to drive time. So I'm, I'm concerned about the traffic. Number, number two, what everybody said here about this creek is absolutely correct. It really rips down through there. Um, but what <laughs> Concerns me is they showed a a, 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 plan, a a slide there showing the um, like a side view. It shows the road and then a six foot berm and then the land. It's, it's flat. I want to know how much land they're going to add in there because when they land, when they add dirt to build up off of that property. When water comes over that creek, and it hasn't for a long time, it hasn't got over that bank, but as a kid I remember that water getting up over that bank, okay, and being in that field and going down Clough and going, geez, that water's not always there. It wasn't. But sooner or later when we have a really big flood, and we're going to get one, as Rick said before, uh, 250 feet of water in his front yard, it was, it was uh, if you can see the little driveway, where the driveway go across, cuts across the trees, it was about halfway to that point where the water was on back in July 16. So what happens when the water gets up? What happens when the dirt is built up and the water has no place to go? Okay, is it going to come up in my front yard? Hope not. I think this is, uh, you know, I empathize with Moses. I would hope for they get as much money as they possibly could for their, their property. And these guys seem to have put together a good project, but they don't live here. And uh, they haven't seen what we've seen. And I hope you guys um, give this the best consideration possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Please come forward.
My name is Robert Burns. I live at 5903 Crittenden. I did not plan to say anything here, but I just uh, think everybody has made some good points both sides. But uh, first of all, there was a land use plan commission or committee. The plan was done less than two years ago. And I don't know if you were involved in it or who was. But I expect the trustees had to make a final decision on it. But they looked at this thing two years ago and decided they knew they had double D next to it. And they said, no, we're going to leave it as A. There was a reason for that. And why? Because of the floodplain or whatever. But I think that decision was made two years ago. And, they, and it hasn't really changed much since then. And since it hasn't, what is the reason to it now? Secondly, just anecdotally, I think we all drive down Clough in the heavy rains like we had this last weekend. You see the Clough becomes just a raging torrent. I'd like to know what would happen if you had pictures. I used to live in Clough Creek Apartments 40 years ago when I first moved here. And the bath pool, and that they say they've lost a apartment building there. Well, I'd like to see what the pictures look like 40 years ago. How bad was that curve right next to this going around? I would think that would be a greater concern to me that over time, this whole project, this whole Clough Creek is going to move. And how's that going to impact everything? True, it, they might try to divine, do something engineering to protect it, but I think that's an inherent problem with the whole project. And that's why I think one of the reasons why the land use people decided to leave it as A, because they recognize that is an issue. So that was my thoughts. I just would be interesting to see what has been the historical perspective 40 years ago, and then taking into consideration what's going to happen to the uh, creek, how's that going to impact that property, and could impact it dramatically, which would be a detriment to the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. My name's Rob Smith, and I live at uh, 2435 Cardinal Hill Court, Reserve of Turpin. Uh, I'm the president of the Homeowners Association, and um, let's see. This is our, uh, just right up here is our entrance, and it comes across uh, Club Pike on Copperleaf. Uh, directly adjacent to this property and then uh, the gentleman's property that spoke earlier that's up here at the entrance. A couple of things I want to mention. Uh, these are our homes in our development that back up to the property. And you can see that they're fairly close to the back side of the property. Uh, what's being proposed is parking on the back side of the property. And I'm assuming the delivery trucks will come in here come around the back and make deliveries back here, uh, which speaks to concerns that we might have about degradation of property values within our neighborhood, particularly these people live in this cul-de-sac, this cul-de-sac, and there's one up a little bit higher. Another thing I would mention is that other speakers have talked to uh, the traffic on Clough, but I would say from our entrance, there's a swim club right next right here as you go up on Clough. And traffic uh, backs up in the morning past our entrance as people go down to the junction of 32 and on to Beachmont. Uh, we also see in the evenings traffic backed up into here as people are going home. And you may not appreciate it if you don't live near Club Pike, how much traffic is diverted there when there's a problem on Beachmont or if there's a problem on the levee uh, crossing. So, and then I, it just occurred to me that uh, if you go over here and you go to this Moats property uh, that was pointed out as being a semi-commercial property, well, that's just not the case at all from my observation. My observation is that there's very little traffic that comes in and out of there. And it's basically just their trucks that occasionally come in and out. But I, I would suggest to you that uh, if you look up and around the top of that property, you have some very expensive homes that back to this property. And then you have more that are being built around this property. It wouldn't be surprising to any of us, I don't think, if within 10 years somebody comes to you and says, okay, well, we're selling our property, Moats is selling their property, 
and somebody wants to put in a development there. Okay, so then you've got developments on both sides of the road that maybe you don't foresee at this point. Okay. Um, I guess that's all that I have to say. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, at this time, we'll uh, turn it back over to the commissioners and we can ask any questions of staff, the applicant, or anyone who has spoken. If you have any questions. <clears throat> yes, uh, this qu my, my question is for the developers. Would you all be able to go a little bit deeper into um, how you plan to combat erosion near Clough Creek? Just to kind of refresh our memories, because we've, we've heard quite a bit tonight. Uh, well, you know, this investment's going to probably be a $30 million or so investment. So the, obviously the last thing we want is to have an issue with flooding or, or the bank failure or that kind of thing. So it's, we're early in the process. We've asked Julian, with the help of ECS, to come up with ways that, to look at what we need to do. We don't really know right now what we would need to do. Um, they've looked at ideas on that corner there of coming on our property line and, and putting you know, some kind of pilings or something down. But they're, they're just looking at alternatives of what we can do. We do not want the property to erode. So we're, we will be investigating that. It's just too early right now. We, have no, we haven't gotten any of their feedback or options yet. Mm -hmm. Does that help answer? I, I wish I knew the answer to it right now, but I don't. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes my questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I had a, um, a question or two for Mr. Begland, if he could come back up. S um, so, yeah, the erosion and the gentleman, Mr. Becker, I think, gave us some pretty compelling pictures that show it's a very difficult situation there. As I'm looking at this picture up here, one of the things initially when um, I looked at you putting your structure there, or the structure going there, is it's going to affect the stream direction and velocity. But as I look at that picture, it already sharply bends around the property already. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It looks like maybe it's been bermed up when it was protected for farming or something. Have you gone on site and can you, can you tell us when that building is built? What impact is there going to be have on the, the stream velocity and direction, particularly as it bends around the property? Okay, so uh, I have personally walked the site, um, both with our uh, surveyors and with our geotech. Um, I've actually walked the stream bed while the water was down, obviously. Um, there is some naturally occurring things that uh, suggest that the direction of the stream uh, started out at least um, through this uh, particular area, uh, cutting through the softest of the soils. Um, it is, I do agree that it is a uh, glacial till. Uh, the geotech report identifies that it, there's a soft sandy layer at the top and a stiffer clay layer below. Um, we have done drillings on site to determine um, the type of soils that are present and uh, it does look to, to be the uh, existing grade appears to be the original virgin soil. So it does not appear to be a fill condition. There's something we look for uh, immediately because a fill condition could uh, provide us with uh, issues of voids, um, deleterious uh, backfill that could be uh, difficult to work with and uh, structurally unstable. So we look at all these factors when we're looking to uh, provide a stable pad for the building and the roadways. Um, but to add to that, the, the, the elevation of the site, um, it is sloping to the rear. And yes, we will have to provide some fill. However, we will be doing a small amount of cut in the back of the site, both to grade the ponds, or uh, I'm sorry, the detention basins, um, in order to provide a volume trade. Um, whenever you do a fill condition, the idea is to try and mitigate that with some volume trade so that your uh, flat water, your, your floodplain, which is permitted under the regulation to be filled in, 
uh, excuse me, filled in the floodplain, um, that that volume doesn't change so that the impact upstream and downstream is not affected. Um, I have spoken also with the gentleman from the county with respect to those items and uh, we've gone over the, the, the general consensus of how this would be constructed and uh, we agree that uh, the proposed development uh, although does move some earthwork and we have a fill and cut condition that it would be designed such that we don't have uh, those upstream and downstream conditions. With respect to the water that's coming out of the ponds, um, there's an existing drainage swell it has a, uh, that comes right through the site. And, and I will call it a drainage swell because it's, uh, it's, it's very, very small. It's uh, got some trees either side. You can see it very clearly on the aerial. Um, we will be enclosing a portion of that to put our roadways over. We'll also be leaving a portion of it open and we'll be draining some of our site into it that currently goes there. So we're trying to keep the natural resources close to uh, the existing condition for the stream or the channel that runs down through the site and then outletting the storm ponds, the storm detention, into that same um, release. So the water comes back into Clough Creek the same way it does today. We're not putting a new outlet into the, the creek. Um, also trying to absorb and, and, and evaporate just the way it is today, but retaining the water and detaining it during a storm event so that while that um, creek is, is running very high with a storm event, we're storing that water and releasing it slowly so that once the event uh, slows down, then we are continuing to slowly release that until the ponds and detention are empty. Does that help answer some yes. of your questions? Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, no questions. <coughs> Paul, I think I have a couple of questions for you. Um, did you, have we talked to the fire department about this whole development? And yes. <coughs> as far as um, the construction of the, or just service, or EMS? Or? EMS and, and I guess, do they have any concerns about, you know, portions of the site flooding at some point in time and them not being able to access the whole site if there was a, a fire or something? Or no. So. A couple of things. This is service out of the Hunley Fire Station, which that's the closest one, and that fire station is actually the one that has the least runs, um, so they can accommodate additional activity. The, as far as the construction, when the applicants were proposing three stories, they needed a drive aisle completely encircling the building. With the reduction down to two stories, that's no longer needed, and that was discussed with our assistant fire chief during our meeting that we had at the township. Um, the building itself, the site is being constructed out of the floodplain and Clough, uh, so there, there's, there hasn't been concern with accessing the site. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to elaborate on that. Uh, yes. With respect to fire, we have talked with the local fire department. Um, so we're doing two things. We're putting uh, fire hydrants front and rear uh, to provide them uh, coverage for the building. The building is 100% sprinkled. So we want to get ahead of any issue. You know, heaven forbid there would be a fire today. Um, the building code is very strict for facilities of this nature. Um, those sprinklers are to get ahead of that. So we hopefully don't um, have anything more than them uh, coming to make sure that, that it's out and it's, it's secure and it's safe. Um, added to which, yes, we've reduced the impervious so we don't have a driveway all the way across the front. But from any point around the facility, um, we have two driveways so that if one is blocked for some reason, the, the fire department can get in on the other one. And that is, that is a very typical of a, a development such as this. It, it's required residentially that you have two points of access. If you look at some of the other, uh, Turpin Woods, for instance, is a single point of entry. If you have a failure of the bridge or something, then it's limited. So they do ask us to provide those dual points of entry. Um, with respect to the elevations, when we were um, early on in the design, we met with uh, the county and, and they did ask us to raise the building an additional half a foot. We were already at five 
uh, 59.5, and we've raised it to 560. Just to give you some uh, perspective, um, just to the south of the site, the riverbed, or the, the bottom of the stream, with the water is all the way down, is at 542. On the um, east side, it's at about 545, okay, running from east to west. So the building elevation is a slab on grade. There's no basement. Is is about 15 feet above that. Um, so th just to give you some some uh, adjustment with the way the site is designed, even where the floodplain is, uh, the water that comes up and spreads out still remains to be about three feet below the finished floor at a at a, a maximum. And those are the elevations we've we've used. Um, the FEMA flood maps. Uh, we've also used uh, historical data for rain events, and we are aware of the recent rain events that were well in excess of that 100 year, and we still do not exceed our finished floor elevation. So we are taking that into account. And I guess <coughs> well, we didn't have to do a full traffic impact analysis because of the number of trips that came out of ITE for the use. Okay. I, I believe you have you been in contact with the county the county will most likely require that yeah, I don't um, believe you have done a complete study we've yet. not done a complete study you're correct we've we've used um, our, our, our traffic engineer to develop our basis of design but in the uh, event we go through for full final design there will be a traffic study that analyzes both um, the, the traffic counts and the driveway volume um, they've been conservative in their uh, calculations at this point. And have you looked at the site distance on both of those axes? Yes, we have, and the site distance is adequate for a low volume driveway use. And Paul, I, I guess, uh, you know, this, this really concerns me. Mm. It really does. And when you see the whole coal, everything down here, um, the creek, based on these areas and so forth, does not appear to be on this property. But who has, I mean, obviously it's, it's on individual's property, however you slice it up. Um, who has control or jurisdiction over this kind of erosion? I mean, it, we all know it's, it's a problem, but unless you're there firsthand, you probably don't see it on rainy, you know, really rainy day or whatever. So, so the Army Corps, this is a regulation by the Army Corps of Engineer, and then you, the, under Army Corps of Engineer, you have the Hamilton County, who's our floodplain administrator as well. Um, several things that have been done to help that issue is this building here, this detention basin in uh, back serves as a detention that feeds into Clough Creek. Um, the township did purchase the open space, which is next door as well, which is over nine acres. Um, so those are some th attempts the township has done to, to help this issue, and it's unclear uh, through those pictures, you know, what caused that particularly, if that was before this detention was been, this has only been in place for 10 years, this building is only 10 years old. Um, but that has helped a great deal of what we've been hearing from the business owners down in that area and some of the residents that this detention basin has helped a great deal of the water that has gone downstream. But as far as ultimately the Army Corps of Engineers in control of that, that creek. Is there, is there any kind of neutral party that could, maybe I'm, I'm the only one, but that could better educate us on this? I think the township, if the Zoning Commission was interested, could look at hiring uh, a third party consultant to look at that. I know it's something that we have done in other cases, especially, you know, um, situations like these. So if that is something that the Zoning Commission is interested, it's something we could do. That's all that I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. sure. I have another Come. question for the engineer. So you talked about the finished floor level elevation. What elevation is the proposed drive? The driveway actually is very, very close. We have a positive drain uh, slope across all the driveways that meet the elevation, but because of the accessibility, um, the sidewalks are at the finished floor with a 2% slope, and then the pavement is just a, a small amount lower than that, and then we do a hydraulic analysis of our inlets and piping to make sure there's not a hydraulic overload from those to the pond or to the detention. I'm sorry I use that term. I, I try not to use terms that maybe the public are not familiar with. Um, so detention basin sometimes may uh, confuse some. But um, we, we designed the entire site 
it is uh, both walkable for anyone that's uh, using a wheelchair or accessible um, vehicle. Um, so the pavement basically is very similar to the to the height of that, and then the site drops off from there. So the pavement will be entirely out of the floodplain. Yes, that 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 is correct. Okay. That is correct. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions for anyone who has presented tonight? Or? Okay, at this time I will close it. I'm sorry, we had we closed it for public. I'm clarify the pictures a little. Just a little so Do you need a clarification on the picture? I, I don't think so. I appreciate that, but I think Commissioner McBride is, is good. I'm, I'm sorry, we're good, sir. Okay. This time we'll close it and I'll open it up to... Uh, Discussion among the commissioners. Anyone wants to make a comment? No, I can. I can yeah, start. I'll, I'll make. I guess I'll start off. Um, so the I I think we heard a lot of excellent comments and remarks from um, the people who live there and are going to be affected by it, such as what's going to happen with this long term. 20 years from now. I always have that question. And I think it's it's a good one. Um, where does a development like this belong? We just approved something very similar to this over on Beachmont Avenue, and I think we had two people show up. But, um, so that's a valid question and a good observation, I think. And uh, the pictures that Mr. Becker handed out um, brought some um, things to life for me. Um, with all that being said, I am supporting, I'm in support of the development for a few reasons. Um, one is there are not negative remarks from EMS on this. These cases always go to the fire departments and are reviewed carefully. Um, in looking at that picture, and that's why I asked the engineer, uh, the main concern I would have with this, and I think when they do their final development plan, we need to have some very solid uh, geotech engineering on this. But you see the bends in the river are already there, and there's nothing there today. So I don't, I'm not feeling strongly that when they build this development, it's going to have an impact. But more importantly, uh, the information we got tells you that there's more than this this board that reviews this kind of thing and we received into evidence or an ex exhibit tonight uh, from Hamilton County says the proposed development will not be approved if there is any increase in flood levels stormwater retention requirements or soil erosion above what is acceptable under the regulations that might jeopardize the safety and well-being of the community as well as any changes to the existing conditions that would negatively impact the stream and adjacent properties. So while some of these pictures were compelling, the count, Claremont can, or Hamilton County shared jurisdiction over this. They're going to review all this stuff, and they have s civil engineers who will make sure that it's not just what the developer is saying, but that their numbers stand up before this will ever see a building permit. So really what we're focusing on here as a zoning commission is, is this the right place for it? And I did appreciate the county planning commission being true, but maybe not giving it much in-depth thought as to whether it complies with our plan. And I'm convinced with the remarks that our staff did in taking a deeper look at this, that they see that it is compliant with our plan and when you look at it with the surroundings, um, you know, it is uh, fairly well suited for this with the apartment next door, the township green space next to that. There's not going to be development across from that. There is a fairly intensive agricultural development right across the street. So you're not going to have a lot of direct impacts if this goes in. The design of it's pretty good. Um, and the traffic is going to be, that's why I was asking about the single family, which could go in there as of right. Granted, it's not going to be built on about half of it, 
But if you put single family houses in, in that, it's going to have a greater uh, peak traffic impact uh, than this is going to have. So, um, you know, with that being said, I, I uh, would really like to see uh, in the future the geotech be very solid on this. But, um, you know, as far as what we have jurisdiction over here in zoning, I would be in support of it. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else want to offer input? Commissioner Reagan. Um, <clears throat> first off, I'd like to say I think it's impressive that we have this level of citizen and community engagement with this project. Um, I think that this is democracy at its best, the fact that so many people took time out of their busy days and weeks to come here and voice their opinions. This is what strong communities are built upon. Um, and I also think that, you know, frankly, the developers have done their homework on this. And staff has done their homework. And my fellow commissioners have done their homework. Um, and I think that we've had a sober, cogent, and serious discussion tonight about the implications of this project. Um, and I think that as we move forward with development in Anderson Township, um, there's always a balance to strike between what the township has been, currently is, and will be. Um, and I think that those equities definitely come into consideration with this project. Um, and that being said, um, after weighing all the factors, I am in support. Um, I do echo uh, the point of my fellow commissioner that EMS has not um, expressed opposition to this, that we are not the only board before which this project will come. Um, and I also believe that uh, the developer's um, history of uh, modifications of the project to help it fit in better with how Anderson is um, and what we want it to be shows their commitment to getting this right. Um, and I think the fact that they're willing to invest $30 million in our community <coughs> Uh, shows that they have a serious economic incentive to make sure that this doesn't fail. Um, and I believe, uh, though, as, as we move forward, um, we always should pay attention to the environmental impacts of these projects, which is why we ask questions about things like erosion of Clough Creek. And I do believe that the developer and the other boards before which this project will come will take those into consideration. and. I think that uh, this process has been conducted well, uh, and that's why I'm in support of this project. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I guess you know, from a from a land use standpoint, um, these folks are asking for a zone change to be able to construct a different type of residence, residential use, and it's not something that we all we have a lot of in the township. Um, but I think it's something, it's a type of residential development that I think most of us anyway would agree that we need more of in the township because this kid isn't getting any younger anyway. Um, and um, I, I think from a land use, when you look at it with the multifamily um, to the east and the double D and it's stopped with the township open space um, to, the, to the west, um, I, you know, I feel, I feel comfortable with, with the land use. I am, um, I am concerned about Clough Creek, um, and um, I, I think that that's something that the developer is going to have to look at, have to work, they're going to have to address whatever Hamilton County puts to them in terms of um, mitigating any impact that they may have on that. Um, and I, but I would be supporting the project, but I will say to you guys, you will need to bring your A-game with the final development plan. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? I'll just offer a few comments that uh, when we do a comprehensive plan, whether it's 1996 or 2006 or 2016, we don't know in advance what the use is going to be for some land. That's why we have this process to make zoning changes from DD to A or, or, or however this is going. So when the notes came before the, uh, the commission, um, from the initial meetings, it looked like there was several issues, the intensity of the development, 
uh, the disruption of Clough Creek, the traffic noise, the increase, the uh, character of Clough Pike, and those are all legitimate concerns. And I think the, the applicant has tried to mitigate some of those. They're not going to go away. The problems we have with Clough Creek are, were there before this came before the commission. They're going to be there with or without this development. So again, to echo what uh, Commissioner McBride said, this, this is the first step of many. And uh, I'll close my remarks short of the three minutes. Um, at this time, I would entertain a motion. Commissioner McBride. Um, well, this is one of the harder ones, actually, I've, I've had to do in 20 odd years. So um, I would make a motion that um, we approve the request for a zone change from a residence district to double D um, plan multiple residence district for the properties at 6201 and 6301 Clough Pike, which is our zone change case 3-2018 Anderson. And I would make that motion subject to all of the recommendations and conditions contained in our staff report. I second. Well, before we second, the other commissioners want to add any amendments to the first motion? <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry. Commissioner. I second. Roll call, please. Ms. McBride? Yes. Mr. Gothard? Yes. Mr. Ellis? Yes. Mr. Reagan? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Thank you for everyone. Very At this time, you take a motion. Yes. 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 Yes